So, we sports fans always talk about home court advantage, but we might just want to be a visitor this time. What's up guys, it's your boy Rich here back at it again, and today we have a bold watch that is also a minimalist at the same time. What? I know. Come on, I'll show you what I mean. Let's go. And here is Visitor's Veil vale Park, the first in the officer's lineup. And it is in a wonderful 39.5 millimeters with 47 from lug to lug and just 11.6 millimeters thin. So let's start with the case of this design because it is very unusual and very striking and very angular from certain vantage points. If we notice the lugs right here, they don't just angle downwards, but they actually curl into a ball right here at the tips right there. And I think that helps soften the look from the rest of the watch. And in fact, I think this watch has notes of Patek Nautilus, but really just right here on the side profile. And I think that works with this watch. At the top of the show, I use the word minimalist when describing the Veil Park. And what I mean by that is on the dial. Because in a lot of instances, a watchmaker either simply ignores it or just doesn't know what to do with the dial. Where it's really simple looking and he will often try to pass that off under the ruse or guise as minimalism. Oh, it's a minimalist dial. But when it's not done intentionally and with passion, we can see right through that. And in the case of the Veil vale Park, it is done intentionally and with a lot of passion. And when it's done properly, we get a really nice end product with a really clean looking minimalist dial that works really nicely on this watch. The dial itself is done in a matte black finish and it is what's called a sandwich dial, which means there are two dials. The top dial often supports the carved or the cutouts uh, of the numbers and in this case the droplets and it also produces a really strong c3 super luminova uh, and instead of numbers they use droplets here with three droplets on the 12 o'clock three o'clock six and nine and we'll talk more about that later the hour and marker hour and minute hands also have a really wide stance and another fun and interesting point is See these four bars there, there, here, and there? That's actually called the crosshairs. A, a lot like the crosshairs through the point of view of a rifle scope. And we'll also have more fun with that a little later on. I think everything comes together really nicely on the Vail Park. And if we turn the watch over, we see a solid case back. Okay, all right, nothing earth shattering, nothing fancy here. But some of us prefer an exhibition back where we can see the movement, while some of us prefer a solid case back. And in this case, we get both. And no, I don't mean that we need x-ray vision to be able to see the movement through the solid case back. And that's because if we just unscrew the crown just slightly right here, voila. The case back opens, revealing the movement. A, Mio a nice Miyota 9015 with a custom gold tone rotor right here and this is actually a really nicely nicely decorated movement here this is this is really nicely done and the lining of the case back is done in a perlage finishing uh, this movement looks to be this is very tasteful I, I do like this the branding of visitor right here on their gold rotor and we get to see more information on the back of this watch as well along the top where it says Visitor Watch Company, and then the, at the bottom here it says Veil vale Park. And then on the side right here it says Indiana, and that's because Phil, the owner of Visitor Watch Company, is from Indiana. And if we are worried that uh, the crown might interfere with our time setting, well, no worries, because this happens well before the crown disengages the thread and enters the winding position. So this is very intricately well conceived and thought out. I think a lot of watchmakers might just be happy to come up with this type of concept here, but it would seem to take the mind of an engineer to be mindful of, of the crown not disrupting the time setting. And that's because Phil was an engineer for Toyota. And this is a, a real nice officer's case back. And this is something that we would expect from a lineup called the officer's lineup. And this is, the back is done in a real 
sapphire crystal, exhibition sapphire crystal, which is the same as on the front, which is a real sapphire crystal. So let's talk about this strap for, for a moment. This is a genuine leather two-tone strap and a lot of straps are referred to as two-tone when they're really just one solid color because it is just a solid color strap with contrasting stitching. But in this case, it is a real two-tone strap and in some lighting conditions, it looks like it's black and brown and in others, it looks like it's navy and brown. And I think it's coming across as black and brown right now. But you see the, the tip right here? It looks like the medallion toe of a wingtip dress shoe right here. And, and that matches what we saw earlier at the 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 and 9 hour markers with the three with the three, three droplets there as well. So I thought this is actually a pretty a pretty cool little feature here on the on the tip of the strap. It's not something that other people would notice, but it is something that that we, we, we would notice and appreciate. So I'm going to have to ask Phil if his favorite dress shoe is a wingtip, and if so, what brand? I'm going to guess Allen Edmonds because Allen Edmonds is out of Wisconsin and Phil is out of Indiana, so it could be a Midwest thing. So let me, let me put this watch on for a second. Hold on just a second. And here it is. I think it sits comfortably on the wrist. It is a very comfortable watch here, and, you know, I just think this is a really sharp-looking watch and really well done and the price of the veil park is eight hundred dollars at the time of this filming so when i first unboxed or unzipped the case of this watch to be more accurate i was met with a couple of immediate thoughts the first was wow this is a really cool looking watch and then because of that minimalist style it immediately settled down in a good way because i think if the dial continued to be somewhat aggressive uh, like some of the angles of the case design, I think that would have given it more of a novelty type feel instead of being really captivating the way the veil park ends up to be. And then I started to notice other details of the watch, including that really awesome two-tone leather strap along with that officer's case back. And I think everything comes together really nicely. Earlier, I touched on the owner of Visitor Watches being a former engineer. But who exactly is Phil Roddenbeck, the watchmaker and owner of Visitor Watches? Well, I can tell you he is a very pleasant and cheerful individual who doesn't seem to take himself too seriously. In fact, on Visitor's webpage, he has a segment there called Let's Speak Watches, where he doesn't automatically assume that we're all advanced in horology, and he notes that. He says we were all newbies in the watch hobby at some point. Very true. And here we get to learn uh, the different... Uh, terms of a watch such as where the crown is, what a crown is, what's the difference between a dial and a sandwich dial, all stuff that I still find very fascinating. Uh, and he also points out that he's from Indiana and he notes that also on the back of his watch. And you know most of us don't know about the origins of a watchmaker, we don't even think about the origins of a watchmaker. Unless he's Gerald Genta, in that case we want to know everything there is about him. And that stands out because we don't often get this kind of information. And by pointing out that he is from the Midwest, uh, I think we start to appreciate that because we, we know the hardworking values of people from the Midwest. And I think that translates really nicely into his watches. Uh, and I know Phil also is a really big fan of Seiko and De Bethune and, and Cartier, a really eclectic mix of watches from the lower end watches to the higher end watches. And he communicated to me that he is a really big fan of Seiko because Seiko offers something for every, every demographic. And I think he's clearly taken elements of a, a bunch of different ranges of watches into developing a really nice watch of his own. I think Phil is a great example of how an independent watchmaker listens to us and values our feedback. The model that put visitor watches on the map was the Dune Shore and it was a wildly successful campaign. And it was a big watch at 44 millimeters. And a constant feedback was hoping that he could make a smaller size watch. And Phil delivered on the 39 and a half millimeter Veil Park. And I think this is a great instance of what a micro brand can do for us. I mean, can you imagine Rolex asking for our feedback before they enter production of a watch? And I think the Veil Park represents the very epitome of a custom watch from open communication with us, the consumers, and the watchmaker. I think the Veil Park is an easy recommend. Whether it is priced at or near $800, I still think that represents a pretty decent value, especially if we put that up against other Swiss brands 
priced similarly that are carried in department stores, such as a Raymond Wilde or a Movado, because I think the Veil Park offers something much more unique than the cookie cutter watches that we see in the display windows of department stores. And we know that the movement is easily serviceable. So I think all of these points are legitimate points in favor of the Veil Park. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you the next time. I'm going to have to ask Phil about that crosshairs design on the dial. I wonder if he's sending a message saying that he is in the crosshairs of other Swiss brands thinking he is a threat to them. Oops, excuse me, I just dropped his veil park. Rolex! So the model that put visitor watches on the map is their Dunshore. 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 Reggie Miller's pay... Reggie Miller's Indiana Pacers may have been a great team, but they never beat Michael Jordan's Bulls. Eh, it's true, but I'm not sure if I can fit that in. <laughs>